Welcome. My name is Stephen Strauss, and I will be your host for this webinar. This is Correlated Magnetics webinar entitled Smart Magnets for Precision Alignment in Product Design. At this time, I will start the webinar. Today's presenter will be Jason Morgan, and he is Vice President of Engineering for Correlated Magnetics Research. Thank you, Stephen. First, let me tell you a little bit about Correlated Magnetics Research. We were founded in 2008. Our first years were focused on developing magnetic solutions and magnetization technology, and the past couple of years have been focused on bringing these smart magnet solutions to market. We have a core set of scalable solutions in our catalog that allow us to respond to a variety of product design needs. We have a talented team of engineers to help bring those product designs to market. Our business is to deliver the magnets that make these features possible in your products. Our factory works with first class suppliers and our proprietary technology to make sure the solutions we develop for you can be delivered to your customers. Today's focus is magnetic alignment. We'll first look at using conventional magnets for system alignment. We'll then show you a smarter alternative for clean product design and a great user experience using polymagnets. We'll show you how to ensure proper orientation in your system with polymagnets. And we'll have an example of rotational alignment to show you. We'll also show you how to get precision, uh, get improved precision in magnetic systems by combining magnetic and mechanical features in your product. Finally, we'll tell you a little bit about our polymagnet catalog and our custom alignment solutions. Alignment seems like a natural application for magnets. Neodymium rare earth magnets have a high energy density, so you can get a lot of force in a small package. These magnets are roughly 50 millimeters long. The problem is the way they interact. This graph is the way we look at alignment uh, with our magnets. Um, you see the vertical axis is the, is the force, um, and the, um, uh, the horizontal axis is the lateral displacement. So uh, as the white arrow shows on the picture of the magnets, as they move um, to the side with respect to each other, uh, we measure the force both in the normal direction, which is the holding force, and in the lateral direction, which is the shear force. Uh, if you look at their force, these magnets' force curve as a function of their lateral offset, you'll see that they have a high force, a high holding force, even when they're off-center. This means that they're likely going to attract in the wrong place, and then they're going to have a high frictional force holding them there in that position. Now look at the alignment force, which is the lower curve on the chart. While this paramagnet provides 40 newtons of holding force at a one millimeter gap, uh, at that same gap it has a peak alignment force of less than five newtons. If you're trying to align a system using conventional magnets, you're not going to get much help. It's too easy for the magnets to pull the accessory and device together when they're out of alignment, and then the force in the shear direction is not going to overcome that frictional force. Our polymagnets are different. The magnets shown here are the same size as the conventional magnets in the previous charts, but these are remagnetized to incorporate our patented alignment circuit. If you've followed our company, you've probably heard us talk about applying Barker codes from communications theory to magnetic systems, and that is what we've done here. This greatly improves the alignment performance of these systems. The top left arrow on this graph shows a strong peak force, the holding force, of a little over 50 newtons when the magnets are in alignment. As we move to the right on the graph, indicating that the magnets are moved out of alignment, this force falls off very rapidly. The lower arrow on the graph shows that with an offset of between eight and 18 millimeters, these magnets actually repel. And that means in your system, uh, the components will actually feel like they're floating until they are more closely aligned, getting more in, um, uh, closer to the alignment point than that distance. This arrow shows the, the peak alignment force. That's roughly 20 newtons as this curve shows. Um, this strong force provides much more assistance to the user uh, to bring the, the components into alignment. The strong alignment force combined with this narrow shape of the holding force and the, the repel in the holding force gives the systems a feeling of self-alignment as you bring them close together. Now look at the holding force beyond about 18 millimeters of displacement. There's very little positive holding force outside of the region where we have a strong alignment force. This essentially eliminates the possibility of attachment 
when the components um, are laterally offset. So let's look at a direct comparison between the conventional magnet and the polymagnet. The conventional magnet has a high off-peak holding force. When, the, when a conventional magnet is misaligned with its mate, you get a reduction in the force, but not significantly so. That means that the accessory is going to come into contact with the device even when the, when the parts are out of alignment. Uh, this is going to lead to frictional force that's going to keep the products from coming into alignment. Um, the, the alignment magnet, on the other hand, when, it's, when it is out of alignment, it has very little force uh, and even has a, a little bit of a repel, um, minimizing friction until the, uh, until the accessory is close to alignment with the, uh, with the device. If you look at the shear force uh, comparison between the conventional magnet and the polymagnet, you see that the conventional magnet has very low alignment force. Remember that these two magnets, or these two magnet pairs, are the same size. These are essentially the same magnets, um, one just uh, um, coated with the alignment polymagnet pattern. Um, the alignment polymagnet has much higher force in the shear direction for a much improved user experience. How do we put these smart magnets to work in our product? First of all, remember that alignment is a magnet to magnet application. So we use magnets in both our device and in our accessory. We want two polymagnet pairs separated by some distance in our product. That's going to let us get a better alignment torque for the overall system. In many cases, we can eliminate any kind of mechanical alignment features, uh, giving us a very clean design. Uh, this of course depends on the required attachment accuracy, and we'll talk more about how to improve that accuracy later. We get improved holding force and a more secure feel in the way the tablet and cover come together in this system. No slamming together and no misalignment for a much better overall design. Let's look at the user experience. Um, with this, uh, this self-aligning system. Um, notice that as, the, uh, as the, the cover and the tablet are offset, um, we really get no interaction between the magnets. Uh, there's no resistance to motion and there's no, um, uh, there's no interference. So um, they move freely and uh, so the user can move them freely to a point where uh, they're close to alignment. Um, as they get close, the accessory will feel like it's floating above or away from the device, um, offering no resistance. And then as it gets within about a centimeter, um, you'll start to get a positive alignment force toward the proper position. Uh, and uh, that's going to allow it to pull together nicely. As the, uh, as the accessory gets close to the proper alignment position, you're going to reach the highest alignment force and increasing holding force. And what this is going to do is pull the accessory into the proper position. And uh, so they'll actually uh, click together. Uh, they'll go from uh, floating away from each other to uh, rolling past that, uh, that resistance and clicking together. And uh, this makes for a, a very good feel as the, as the accessory uh, moves into position. As you see, when you get into alignment and you, um, you have the device uh, click into place, you get the highest holding force and you have the accessory securely attached to the device. We can take this same concept and we can apply it in a two-dimensional array to our magnets. This will give us alignment and shear resistance in two dimensions. Uh, look at our, our force curve here. It's a, it's a thumbtack chart. It shows the force as our magnets are offset in the X and Y dimension with respect to each other. Notice that as the, as the magnets are slid into, uh, start, are starting to be slid over one another, um, you see that the, uh, the force is actually repulsive. This is similar to what we saw with our, our other Barker alignment magnets. Um, so the magnets will actually try to push away from each other when they first start to engage, uh, el eliminating any kind of resistance. And then as they come into alignment, you see that we have a very strong force. Um, these, these magnets have the added benefit of being able to maintain 
the orientation in our system as well. Our Barker codes can be used in circular arrangements as well. These magnets are about 25 millimeters in diameter and about 3 millimeters thick. If you, um, if you look at the way these interact, uh, you see on the force curve that they have a, a single preferred location, uh, basically at zero degrees, and that the holding force at that point is twice that of a conventional magnet of the same size. Now this is for a 1.5 millimeter gap, and the horizontal axis on this curve is the uh, degrees of rotation. So as you move away from zero degrees and rotate toward um, 50 degrees, you'll see that the, uh, the holding force falls off rapidly uh, and even goes to a repulsive force as you get over 50 degrees. So we can use this to hold, hold your system together securely at the preferred location, but then make it easy to reconfigure by, uh, by incorporating this twist release function. So well, here's the alignment torque. The arrow on the uh, lower right graph indicates the high torque toward the preferred location. You see uh, between you know, zero, and, um, zero and 75 degrees, you have a torque back to zero. And then as you get up uh, over 280 degrees, you have a torque toward 360, or again, back to that zero point. Now these, these polymagnets can be um, configured with multiple alignment points or detents depending on your needs. Note that for these magnets, there's a wide area without a significant torque or holding force. This would allow you to design a system with a twist release feature and make it easy to uh, disengage a, uh, an accessory from a device, but easy to, to engage and then twist into uh, position and have a high holding force. Let's look deeper at the force characteristics of these magnets. This chart shows the holding force. You see that at uh, zero degrees, you have a high holding force of about 70 newtons. That force is gonna decline uh, with either a positive rotation or a negative rotation over a range of about 80 degrees total. But if you look at the torque curve here, you'll see that um, while we have high torque at about 30 degrees, as we get closer to the equilibrium point, we actually have very little force. This is not unexpected, and it often doesn't matter. If your application requires high precision, however, this can make the attachment feel sloppy. This is not desirable in tools, cameras, and other products where precision is required. We need to improve this interface to make it more precise while keeping our ease of assembly and configurability. Look at the torque curve here at the point indicated by the arrow. That's the peak. That's at roughly 30 degrees from the center point, from the equilibrium point. If we were to design our system so that the magnets are held at this point, we'll have an active clamp feature in our product. We're going to give up some of the holding force, as you can see, but we're going to have a much more precise system because we're going to have that active clamping. So here's a possible solution. We can achieve this by incorporating mechanical stops in our system that engage when the magnets are offset at that peak torque. This gives us a positive stop, precise engagement, and reconfigurability. Now we can do this for these, uh, for these rotational alignment magnets, and we can also do it for linear magnets. The key is designing a stop so that, uh, so that our magnets are, will hold uh, the system in tension um, at this peak force. We've presented a number of applications for alignment polymagnets, and now I would like to tell you how to get the right one for your product. We have a catalog of standard polymagnets with a range of alignment magnets in sizes suitable for mobile phones and accessories, smart tablets, boxes, and various modular products. We have uh, alignment magnets that are specifically tailored for tablet products, uh, such as um, iPad accessories. Now, while our catalog alignment magnets can help you meet many of your product needs, you may also have special needs that call for something a little different. And we can help with that as well. We have a team of magnetics engineers that can create a custom solution for your system. And of course, we have magnets for other applications as well. 
Please refer to our previous webinar or our website for further information on our other high-performance polymagnets that can give your product a great feel and a great user experience. If you need more information or you're ready to get started with your program, please don't hesitate to contact one of our technical sales reps. We have them throughout the country and they'll be happy to help you find the right catalog magnet or help get you started with a custom magnetic solution. That wraps up today's webinar. I very much appreciate your time and attention and now I'll turn it back over to Stephen. Thank you, Jason. That's it for today's webinar. We are now going to go into questions and answers. Are the magnets available in shielded form? In other words, constraining the magnetic field away from sensitive electronic components. Jason? Yes, uh, the, um, the magnets can be shielded uh, by using a, a thin uh, steel shunt. Uh, either as a uh, just a backing or as a partial um, uh, partial cup around the magnet, um, and there's also a characteristic of these polymagnets uh, that the by uh, creating these regions, uh, we we make the field the effective field of the magnet a lot shorter than with the standard magnet. So they they tend to not have um, the same reach as a conventional magnet. They tend to have a, a lower field as at a distance and uh, they can be used in conjunction with the shunt to, uh, to limit the stray field. Okay, um, questions are, are pouring in and I appreciate that. Let me get to the next one. Uh, how does the cost of a polymagnet compare to a similarly sized traditional magnet system? Jason? So the cost of a polymagnet is going to depend somewhat on the complexity of the pattern. Um, the uh, uh, but the uh, the overall cost of a polymagnet, uh, while it, while it is more expensive than a traditional magnet, it has the same materials, made of the same material, and then we have our, our added processing on that. Um, it's not um, it's not extraordinarily more expensive. Uh, we certainly find that um, uh, our customers find them to be reasonable, especially when often you can get by with a a smaller magnet uh, and get the same strength. So uh, it varies from magnet to magnet. Uh, they are a little bit more expensive than um, than a, a traditional magnet, but uh, but not um, significantly so. And uh, Stephen, what what I should say is that um, you know um, since that does vary from case to case, and I can't give a specific answer there, uh, what would be ideal is to um, uh, to contact one of the representatives that was listed uh, on the webinar or listed in our website. And we'd be happy to provide a quote for uh, for um, your specific system. Thank you, Jason. Um, next question is: How small can these polymagnets be made? We deal with uh, with these magnets that are, uh, you know, the the traditional magnetic material, um, and they can be made. the The size depends on the function that you're trying to uh, trying to achieve. We have uh, catalog uh, alignment magnets. That are um, you know on the order of um, uh, one inch long by about an eighth by about an eighth. Um, now the uh, a little bit larger uh, has more of an advantage over a conventional magnet as far as strength has a little bit more working range. Um, but uh, but in general we can we can achieve a, uh, a, a strength advantage um, for magnets that are down to you know. Uh, really as small as 12 millimeters in one dimension, um, but to, to get the alignment functionality uh, alignment functionality that we talked about in the webinar today, we really need uh, probably about 25 millimeters or an inch in order to, uh, in order to get that. Okay, um, next question. Can polymagnets be made into a stable magnetic bearing? Jason? So we can use polymagnets to provide uh, a level of isolation and, and therefore uh, minimize friction. But um, in order to uh, create that, um, uh, in order to create that, we require an axial constraint. So if you're making a magnetic bearing, you can certainly support, uh, certainly support or keep a distance between uh, two surfaces. But you will need a, an axial constraint either on the outside or uh, with an axle. Uh, so uh, some. Uh, sort of a two-part question. 
Uh, we can't do that in, a, in an unsupported or an unconstrained way, uh, but we can we can do it as long as uh, as long as we are, are you know, can make use of some kind of axial constraint. Okay, and the question is, what two D alignment repeatability is possible using polymagnets? Can disk magnets be used for this purpose? Jason? Okay. Um, disk magnets can be used for that purpose. Uh, we can create, um, we can create uh, in fact, we have in our catalog uh, some disk magnets that provide a, a centering function. Um, and so, uh, but as far as re repeatability, like I talked about in the webinar, uh, if you want very fine repeatability, you know, on the order of, um, uh, you know, uh, half a millimeter or so, plus or minus half a millimeter, um, probably going to want some kind of mechanical uh, assist along with the magnetic uh, forces. And the reason is that when the magnets are in equilibrium, there's not, there is not a, um, uh, a significant centering force. So, um, and because they hold together so strongly, as you get near that equilibrium point, you have a lot of friction. And um, so, when I'm going for very high repeatability, I, I like to hold the, you know, hold the magnets against a, a mechanical stop or design in some kind of a mechanical stop and use the magnets as a clamp. Um, the best thing to do here is probably to get uh, some of the magnets um, and try them uh, for your purposes. And uh, you know, I think you'll be able to get uh, around, uh, you know, around a plus or minus a half a millimeter, depending on the system, of course, uh, the coefficient of friction between the surfaces. Um, the uh, you know the size and strength of the magnet, the distance the magnets are apart. Uh, but if you want a very fine repeatability, uh, we'll probably have to add some kind of mechanical feature to the system. Okay, great. So the next question I have is, can you make polymagnets in a in a cylindrical form or a tubular form, Jason? Um, that is uh, that's certainly possible. Um, the um, uh, most our catalog polymagnets are uh, are flat, uh, but we can um, you know they can be created in a in a cylindrical form or tubular form. Um, now they they are going to have a uh, there there are two constraints here. One is uh, the orientation of the material. Uh, you, we you know obviously we magnetize uh, parallel to the um, orientation of the material. So if that material is diametrically magnetized, then you know, we could uh, we can um, uh, magnetize it uh, in, in only that direction. If it's magnetized along the length, or I'm sorry, through the length, um, then we can we can magnetize in that uh, direction. Um, now, uh, we we don't do a lot of, of, of magnets in the cylindrical form, uh, but but we have done we have done some uh, uh, cylindrical magnets, and we have done some odd shaped magnets. Um, the other thing that comes into play there is the um, uh, the thickness. Uh, we do have a limit, a practical limit of uh, uh, you know of how deep or how thick of a magnet we can handle. And so, if it's it's um, very thick material, we, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, also, we um, uh, you know with a um, a, cylind a, a cylindrical form, uh, we're going to be limited to uh, uh, to the radius of that. You know, we can we can only work from the outside of that. So your uh, the wall thickness and the um, uh, the radius of that are going to come into play. Jason, the next one is a uh, is a is an intriguing one, which is uh, and, a, and a fun one. How do polymagnets interact with ferrofluid displays? Which polymagnets produce an effect in ferrofluid which is most different from the effect of a standard magnet? Um, well, cer uh, you know, certainly you're going to see the uh, the magnetic field. Um, the um, hmm, which one is the the most different from the effect of a standard magnet is an interesting question. I mean, they're they're different. You know, some some of the ones that uh, and you you saw in the webinar today some of the patterns that we have. Um, you know, for the uh, for the different uh, uh, you know, magnetic circuits that we put on the magnets, um, some of the um, uh, disc magnets that that provide alignment, are, you know, are going to have some some interesting effects there. Um, 
and uh, and I think these do as well. And they they have uh, they're going to have short fields, but they're going to have an effect that you can see uh, in a ferrofluid. Yeah, and if uh, <clears throat> if you haven't played with ferrofluids and polymagnets, um, what I've done is bought some ferrofluid off the internet and put it in a petri dish, and then hold the magnets underneath, and uh, it's really quite fun to do. Um, okay, so. Um, next question, Jason, is how durable are the magnets? Does the alignment erode over time? What about elevated temperatures or low temperatures? Jason? Um, yeah, so the um, uh, so as far as eroding over time, uh, these are neodymium magnets. And so there is uh, a hard magnetic material, and it does not uh, deteriorate significantly over time. It's considered to have a, a very long life. Um, now heat is the uh, is the enemy of magnets. Um, if you get a magnet above its uh, operating temperature, it is going to start degrading the, the magnetic field. Um, if you can you can raise the temp raise the temperature up, um, you know as long as you keep it below the operating temperature that is set by the rating, um, and it will be weaker while it's working at that higher temperature. But then as it returns to the normal temperature is going to come back to its uh, original strength. If you um, take it above its operating temperature, it can start to degrade um, in a way that it doesn't recover when it comes back down to uh, to normal operating temperature. Um, and then if you get the temperature high enough, um, it's going to demagnetize the magnet, and um, and you would have to remagnetize it in order to uh, uh, to make it work right again. Um, the uh, the normal uh, the normal um, grade for our catalog is uh, just a, a, like an N40 or N42 grade magnet without a, a letter designation, and that means that they're at the the standard um, operating range, which goes up to uh, you know, 80 degrees C. So uh, as long as they, you keep them below 80 degrees C, uh, and some of the, for some of the higher grades like N50, um, it would be a 60 degrees C. As long as you keep them below that. Um, they will. Uh, they should not degrade over time. So, Jason, let me just uh, tack on uh, a few more thoughts onto that, which is that even though the standard catalog um, is with uh, the grades that you mentioned, uh, we do do custom magnets in higher grades. And while we don't have anything on the market right now for samarium cobalt, that is something that we are uh, uh, we are working on. So, if you have higher temperature needs, that's the kind of uh, topic where you would want to contact us directly, and we can give you information on, uh, on how to go about uh, getting those. Uh, the next question is about the iPad, and uh, it asks, uh, what polymagnets do you have for the iPad, and how would those be used? Jason? Yeah, we do have, um, we have uh, magnets for the, uh, for the iPad uh, covers. Uh, for the latest iPads that are out, the uh, the Air, iPad Mini and uh, Air, I'm sorry, the iPad Mini and the um, iPad um, Air, we have um, magnets that could be used to create a cover um, to go with that, um, and so uh, it basically allows you to connect to the side, align in the proper orientation um, as part of a cover or an accessory that that attaches to the side using the the magnets that are um, uh, embedded in the iPad. And those are um, those are about to be released to our catalog. So uh, uh, they are um, they're actually uh, fully developed and uh, will be available um, uh, very soon. So contact the rep uh, about those. They could um, you know we could point you to those magnets. The next one is where are the polymagnets manufactured and are they readily available in China? Jason. Yeah. So our our um, suppliers for the magnetics are in China. Uh, the neodymium magnets uh, do come from China, and uh, we have a factory in China. So um, uh, we have, you know, uh, we have customers that we uh, supply to, um, where the uh, that entire uh, that entire uh, ch uh, chain uh, supply chain is in China. And um, so, um, so the answer to the question, the short answer to the question, uh, is yes, they are available in China. And I'm not sure if I understand this exactly, but it's are the magnet insert moldable? Jason, do you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I think. Um, uh, and and if I, if I get this wrong, if I get the question wrong, please just submit a question again. 
but um, I'm reading that as um, can we uh, can we injection mold around the magnets? Um, and there are uh, a couple of options for that. One is um, we have to keep in mind the the operating temperature of the magnet. So uh, depending on the um, the temperature that's required for injection molding, uh, might be possible. Um, the um, but uh, most injection molding is uh, is done at around uh, uh, you know plastic ABS plastic injection mold is done around 200 uh, degrees C, and so that is well above the temperature that will will damage these magnets. So um, so while it may be possible in some special cases, um, in in general it is um, you know we can't inject the mold around the plastic uh, around the magnets. Um, it is possible to. Um, it may be possible in some cases if we are able to injection mold around the magnet and leave the magnet exposed, um, there may be in some cases we, we could actually go back and magnetize the magnet after it's molded in place. So um, it's a special case, um, but if the magnet uh, is uh, exposed, uh, we may be able to magnetize it after it's in place depending on the size and shape of the, the product that it's going into. Okay, as I said, it, uh, it appears that almost everyone who started on the webinar is still on, but we are now out of questions. So that's it for today's webinar. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please feel free to either email us using the address on your screen or visit the contact page on our website, which is polymagnet.com. And on behalf of Correlated Magnetics, I would like to thank you for attending, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>